how would you define the gospel? I mean, if you got interviewed in Times Square, if you got interviewed in the loop, and someone asked you to define the gospel, how would you define the gospel? Well, that's what we want to do this morning. We want to begin to define the gospel. Galatians is going to be about the gospel. And so we are going to unpack this and talk about this for the next several weeks. So you're with me in Galatians 1 on page 972. Or if you got your phones, again, Galatians 1. Here we go. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, Steve did a great job last week unpacking the background and helping you understand how this all came together. And so I want to remind you again what got us to this point, to this letter. In Jackson's back, we got to have a map. So here's a map. This past five, six weeks, Don and I have been down there where you see Perga and Antalya. We were in the city of modern day Antalya. And that whole region that you see there in, in the pink and the yellow was ancient Galatia. So Don and I spent the last several weeks in Galatia itself. Now you see the one color, the purple color, that was Paul's missionary journey. He and Barnabas came through Cyprus, then up through Perga, and did this journey, this kind of loop, and then when they got to the end, they turned around and went back through that same way, because what they wanted to do was to establish the churches. And we know from the book of Acts that after they established, people had become followers of Christ, people with Jewish background, people who were Gentiles that had no understanding of God whatsoever. They appointed elders, it says, and began to see the church begin to grow. Now they came back to Antioch, they sailed back to Antioch, which was Paul's home church, and they report. They get the leaders together and Paul and Barnabas share, man, we saw this amazing thing take place. As we shared the gospel, people respond. Jewish people respond. Gentiles respond. And we saw the church begin to form. Now it appears that there is this group called the Judaizers, possibly from Jerusalem, who had come up. Now that word Judaizers was developed in the second century. A Judaizer is someone who could have claimed himself to be a Christ follower, but believed that you needed to first become Jewish. You needed to have the mark of circumcision. In fact, what they would have said is that who Paul had converted, who those who become followers of Christ under his teaching, were only partial Christians. They were only half Christians. They needed to first become Jewish so that they might be under the covenant of God. And so what they did, and you see it there marked in red, is they went back to those churches. They went back and they said, I'm sorry, Paul only gave you a partial gospel. I want to give you the rest. Well, word gets to Paul in Antioch. And when he gets it, when he gets the word, he is ticked. He is so angry. And so what he does then is he writes this letter that we call the book of Galatians. Galatians. He writes this to the churches that you see on this map in Galatia. He writes them to say to them, what are you thinking? So let's take a look at this. We see then in verse 6. I am astonished. Now that word really means I am shocked. I am beside myself. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to the, a different gospel. Now let me pause there. What is this gospel? What is this gospel? Let's see if we can take a couple moments and make sure we understand what this gospel is. Gospel comes from the Greek word eugangelion. It means good news. It literally means great news. It started off with a report. Someone would come from a battlefront and they would run all the way back to report. There was a victory. They were called the gospel. And then it got developed and it got attributed to Caesar Augustus. In 63 to 14 AD, when he lived and when he began to rule, they began to see him as a deity. They thought that he was going to bring this great peace upon the world, the Pax Romana. In Purim, which is also in Turkey, they have found several, but they have found these inscriptions about his birthday in the declaration of Augustus being good news. Let me show you this one. 
The birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning for the world of the good news of the gospel that has come to men through him. In essence, what they're saying, it's a victory cry. Long live the king. That the king is going to come and bring peace. He will subdue all the nations and we will have a peace that will reign. It is so like God to take a word that was already in culture and bring it to its fulfillment in Christ. In Luke 2, we see Christ's birth announcement. And look how similar this sounds. Luke 2.10, we'll put up here. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news, the gospel of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, the royal dynasty is what it's alluding to, a savior who is Christ. What is Christ? It means literally the anointed king, the Lord, God. God comes along and says, Augustus is but a shell of the reality of the gospel It is just merely a a shadow, a reflection of what it really means that this can be fully found in Christ. So what is this good news, this gospel that is found in the person of Christ? Let me give you four words that we'll walk through and define. Four words that will help us understand the gospel. And we'll talk a lot about this over the next several weeks. It is an announcement that the king has come, an announcement that the king has come and the work that the king has done. He comes and he redeems. Look with me at verse 4 again, back in chapter 1, verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins to redeem us, to pay a price in order that we might know forgiveness, our sin and rebellion and rejection of God. God has paid for in the death of Christ. Jesus takes on what we deserve and we receive what he deserves. We're redeemed, bought with a price. Second one, we're rescued. Look at the second half of verse four. To deliver us, literally to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God our God and Father. We are rescued. We are moved from spiritual darkness into spiritual light. We are not just redeemed. Our sin is not just paid for. We have been rescued. Let me remind you what Ephesians 2, what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, which is also in modern-day Turkey. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We were once this and there, and we have been rescued from there, and we have been brought into the kingdom of life. We have been brought into the kingdom of God because we have been redeemed by Christ. He restores us. The gospel is also at work restoring us. It restores us back to a right relationship with God the Father. We have been living in rebellion against him, and now we are brought into a relationship. We are now daughters and sons of God. We are brothers to Christ. It's the story of the prodigal son in the book of Luke that has gone on his way and told his father, forget you, I wish you were dead. And yet the father waits every day at the crest of a hill, looking down the path, down the roadway, hoping his son will make it home. And when he sees his son, we're told he runs to his son. He throws his arms around his son and he says, I'm going to restore you to a place of honor again in our family. We have been restored. We are brought back. We are once again included. Turn with me to Galatians 4, and we'll get here in a couple of weeks. Galatians 4, look with me at verse 5. To redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as daughters and sons. And because you are daughters and sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Dad. You are no longer a slave, but a daughter and a son. And if a daughter and a son, then an heir through God. We are restored back. Welcome home. With all the privileges of being a child of the king. And then the fourth one, he renews us. 
The gospel not just only, not only saves us, it just doesn't only just rescue us, it doesn't just restore us back into a right relationship, there is a power at work in us, it renews us. The same gospel that saves us is the same gospel that is at work in us, the same work of grace. It empowers us to be able to pursue spiritual transformation. It is about change in us. And the thing that we need to understand, that as free as this is to us, grace, unmerited favor extended to us, the gospel, the very essence of the gospel, it is not earned, it is not deserved, it is freely given, it is costly. It is costly. It cost Jesus his life. Our rebellion was so serious. It was so serious that nothing short than the death of God's own son could save us. To hear the words of Jesus as he hung on the cross and experienced the full rejection of God reminds us how deep and costly this is. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus becomes one gigantic sin of humanity. Jesus becomes forsaken so that you and I might be saved. Thomas Vanderwood was sitting in his living room and the windows were open and it was a nice summer afternoon and he heard his son running around in the yard and his son was running up and down a small hill in the backyard that had grass had grown over. It's a septic tank and Don and I lived in a couple of homes with septic tanks. Septic tanks is for those that aren't connected to the city water or the city sewage. And so it runs out to a large tank and there's, they put chemicals in there to break it down and it supposedly dissolves and kind of moves into the dirt. But it collects all the runoff, all the crap of the home in a septic tank. And as the young son is running up and down this hill just being a kid, it cracks and he falls in. And the father hears the noise and he hears the cry and he runs out and he sees his son is struggling in this muck, this smell. And his son is beginning to drown in the septic tank. So Thomas jumps in and he picks up his son and holds his son's head above the crap. He couldn't reach the bottom, it was too deep. So he's trying to tread in the midst of this smell, this yuck, this stink, until finally another adult comes and reaches down and crabs the kid, and by this time he's exhausted, and he drowns in the septic tank. You know, the gospel for us is that Jesus comes and steps into this world, the septic tank of this world, the ugliness of this world, and he comes in and he lifts us up and he holds us up to rescue us. He holds us up to save us. But it cost him his life. It cost him his life. Look with me again at verse 6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. You know the word accursed there? It's a very strong word meaning cut off, to fall under the wrath of God. May they fall under the wrath of God if they preach to you a different gospel. Now look again at verse 7. Not that there is another one, but there are some who've troubled you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. What are the distorted gospels that you and I deal with today? What are those distorted gospels that you and I are dealing with today? Let me share a couple of them with you. The universal gospel. 
The universal gospel says any good person, any good person, it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what you pursue, as long as you're a good person, that person is going to go to heaven. That's the universal gospel. The second one, a prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel, also known as the health and wealth gospel, claims that God will reward those who are growing in their faith with a growing health and or wealth. That the atonement in Christ includes not just removal of sin, but also the removal, removal of sickness and poverty. That if you're growing in your faith, you're trusting God more, you are going to get sick less and you're going to become wealthier. Now, ultimately, we believe this to be true. But not necessarily in this life. The prosperity gospel the works righteousness gospel. It's penance versus repentance. Penance, I got to work for this versus repentance as I turn from this. Let me ask you this question. Think about this question for a moment. If you were to deny, die tonight and you stood before God tonight and God says to you, why should I let you in my heaven? By the way, he won't ask you that. But if he was to ask you that, how would you respond? If you died tonight and stood before God and God says, why should I let you in my heaven? How would you respond? How would you answer that? If you, have been, if you begin with, well, I've been a good person. I've done a lot of good things. You don't know all the things I'm engaged in. I give to various charities. I want to be a very good person. I bring that resume with me. Here's my goodness. That's works righteousness. The big C church is full of people pursuing this righteousness. There's people who are very engaged in doing very, very good things, but that are driven from works righteousness. See, works righteousness says there's a scale in the sky that God has and on one side are all my bad deeds and what I need to do is I need to have enough good deeds to make sure I keep this thing tipped in my favor. And we're forever saying, how am I doing to ourselves? Look what I've done. Look what I've done. Works righteousness gospel is full of people who are rules keepers. It's full of legalists who just want to be told, what do I need to do? What rules do I need to keep? I read this summer the uh, biography of Larry Norman, who was the first Christian rock and roller. And he said this about his father, who he thought was a legalist. He says he knows all the rules, but none of the reasons. He knows all the rules, but none of the reasons. Keep the rules, do the right things. Why? Because it will earn me favor. And we remind ourselves what Ephesians 2.8 says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Cheap grace. The cheap grace gospel. It is wanting forgiveness without repentance. It is wanting communion without confession. It is wanting grace without the cross. It is claiming to be a follower of Jesus without following. I want to feel better about myself without understanding really my brokenness. It is people who believe they have prayed the prayer and have never seen a spiritual change. It's easy believism. And then the last one we're going to look at this morning is an incomplete gospel. The gospel of grace is enough to redeem me. It's enough to save me, to pay for my rebellion and my rejection and my sin. But it's not really enough to change me. It gets me in the kingdom, but now it's up to me. Now I must take it upon myself to prove my sanctification, to prove that I'm spiritually transforming. We would quote the verse, I must work at my salvation with fear and trembling. Without seeing the second half of that verse, let me put this verse up here, Philippians 2, 12 
Therefore, my beloved Paul writes to the church in Philippi in northern Greece, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Second half, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Several years ago, Don and I went to Europe and I met with a number of pastors. Don and I met with a number of pastors who have urban churches, young urban churches like Park, because we wanted to learn from them because they're dealing with stuff several years ahead of what we're dealing with here in Chicago. And as we listened to them, and it was a great experience, one of the things we realized is that our language at the time at Park was wrong. I used to say on a regular basis, we want to see people cross the line of faith. Cross the line of faith. Just cross the line of faith. And you know what I was subtly communicating without meaning to is that that was the end of the journey. If we could just get you over the line of faith, you're done. And so we began to talk and wrestle and realize that the far better language for us is being a follower of Jesus because it communicates it is an ongoing thing we do. It is an ongoing thing. And the gospel enables us to do this ongoing thing. The church in America has sought to be so accommodating that we have lost who we are. We have lost the true essence of the gospel. Now, what are the implications of believing a wrong gospel? What are the implications of believing this wrong gospel, whatever it might be for you? Look at the universal gospel. To believe in the universal gospel, you have to be willing to say, Jesus is a liar. Jesus is a liar. Why? Because in John 14, 6, Jesus says this. He says to his disciples as he's with them for one of the last times as he's heading to the cross, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How about the prosperity gospel? What if you don't grow rich? What if you don't get healed? Is it your faith isn't strong enough, or is it God not able to do it, or maybe God doesn't care enough about you? I have seen way too many folks who believe this when they don't see what they expect to happen, walk away from their faith. God can't be trusted. How about works righteousness? You know what happens is we have to ask the question, how much is enough if it's works righteousness? If God's got a scale, how much is enough? When do I know I've got it tilted in the right direction? When can I be convinced I've done enough? If it is works righteousness, Jesus would not need to die on the cross for you and me. Because we could just earn our way into heaven. Works righteousness, people are constantly living with a sense of guilt. Have I done enough? Let me ask you again, if you were to die tonight and stood before God and God said, why should I let you in my heaven? How would you answer? You know what the right answer is? I don't deserve to be included. I have absolutely no right to be included but it's because of Jesus and Jesus' death that he has redeemed me, he has rescued me, he has renewed me. It's because of the work of Jesus that I have a card, I have entry into the kingdom of God because of Jesus. Not because of you. Not because of me. Cheap grace. If you are not being confronted by your view of the gospel, you have a wrong view of the gospel. If your gospel is not confronting you in the way in which you think and live and is calling you to repent and is calling you to confess and is calling you to change, you don't know the gospel. If you think you can live any way you want to and call yourself a follower of Christ, you don't understand the gospel. The incomplete gospel. And I gotta tell you, this is where I would battle. This is where I, I have struggled in my life from time to time, right here, the incomplete gospel. When you have an incomplete gospel, the gospel that is able to save you, but now it's your job to make sure sanctification is taking place, you never live with full joy and contentment. Our lives are marked by fear. 
We live a powerless life. We have forgotten that the Spirit of God resides in us, dwells in us, empowers us, encourages us, convicts us, leads us. And we'll talk more about this in the weeks to come. There's some of us in here that need a refresher course. And I want to remind you that we host something here called Alpha. It is a great program. And Alpha will remind you of the gospel. It takes several weeks and you, you meet in a small group and you have a meal together and you can ask any question you would like. You can ask the hard questions and it gives you an opportunity to reorient yourself to what is the gospel. And maybe some of you are here and you've come with the arm of a friend and this is all new to you and you're just kind of going, the gospel, I mean, it rings true in some way and yet it seems confusing. Alpha is perfect for you. Come, kick the tires, ask the questions. We want to invite you to be a part. Yesterday, we had my dad's memorial service right here in this room. He died a couple of weeks ago. We loved him. He was a godly man. I learned a ton from him. He was so fun. He was just a fun, fun guy. And so for us, it was really a true celebration. You know, today, singing the songs we sang about the resurrection or whatever had kind of a fresh feel to me. My dad is experiencing that. But yesterday, I shared this story I want to share with you. Let me show you a picture. Here's a house that, on the right, it's the house I grew up in. And when we moved in, the house that you see with the red circle on it wasn't there. They were beginning to build it. And I'm in grade school and, and uh, uh, young, and, and my parents, of course, the first thing they say to me is, don't go in that house, man, it's dangerous. Don't go in there. That's not your stuff. And where do you think is the one place I wanted to go? So it's late afternoon. My mom's inside making dinner. I sneak over next door. I start climbing up. I mean, it's just a frame. And I start climbing up, and I get all the way to the top of that dormer that you see right there. And I get all the way up and I just go, this is so cool. It's that kind of scary feeling that you're up high, but you see a lot. And all of a sudden I turned around to get down and I couldn't get down. I, had, I didn't have a way to get down. And so I'm up there probably for an hour freaking out. And my dad pulls up in the car from work. And my dad, you just got to know my dad. My dad gets out, he's walking the house, he looks over, he sees me. Hey. And he walks over, he looks up at me and goes, so uh, what you doing? And I go, I'm just, you know, hanging out. <laughs> and he says, well, you know what, we need, we need to go in for dinner, man. You know, my, your mom's making dinner and I bet your dinner's just about ready. We need to go in. So come on down. Um, I can't. Dad, I can't get down. I don't know how to get down from here. I've been here for like an hour. I don't know how to get down. So my dad, here's what my dad does. He puts out his arms. He goes, all right, jump. Now, my dad was 6'2", and, and as a kid, man, my dad was strong. You know, I remember him taking a stack of bricks and moving them. You know, you just think your dad's the strong. He's Popeye, you know, he's strong. And so he puts out his arms, and he goes, jump. And I'm thinking, okay, can he catch me? Can he catch me? And I say to my dad, uh, no. In my mind, I'm thinking, you got a plan B? Let's go get a, we got to have a ladder or something, don't we? And my dad goes, come on, jump. And now I got to calculate, do I believe my dad will catch me? How high up am I? You know, what will happen if he doesn't? And I'm having to walk through this. And it took me a while. And finally, I kind of scooted to the edge as much as I could. And I jumped and he caught me. And then he walks me into the house, and we sit down at dinner. And then we have the conversation, what I'm doing in that house. <laughs> but there is a picture of the gospel. You and I find our way into something that we can't back out of. We find ourselves in a place that we can't save ourselves from. We cannot get down. We cannot get out. And the gospel says that God comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus holds out his arms and goes, jump, I'll catch you. And then we've got to process that. By faith, we have to go, is he big enough? Can I trust this? Is he the one that we really can believe in? And then every follower of Christ 
has scooted to the edge and has jumped. And every follower of Christ has been caught. Every follower of Christ has been rescued. But that's not the end of the gospel. Just like my dad walked me into the house, I was his son. He loved me. He spoke to me, but he loved me. He included me. Our father catches us in Christ and he includes us in the house and we sit together as his sons and daughters and we enjoy all what it means to be his son and daughter. That's the power of the gospel. Let's bow our heads. Let me ask you a question. With your heads bowed, just let me ask you a question. What distorted view of the gospel are you believing? What distorted view of the gospel have you been believing? Now, I'm going to be real honest with you. Some of you are lying to yourself right now. You are not willing to be honest with yourself and to admit you have had wrong views of the gospel, just like me. But we need to confess the wrong views of the gospel so that we can embrace the true view of the gospel. Father, right now, there are people sitting in this room and they're fighting you and they're telling themselves something that's not true, may your spirit disclose to them the areas that they have believed that are not true. Start with me, Lord. And may as we go through the book of Galatians, may we get clarity around the power of this grace-filled thing called the gospel. This good news that you have come in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. The King has come. And we proclaim his victory. In Jesus' name we pray.